Hi, everyone. It's Rebecca Imholtz again with the whoop, Mount Pleasant Chamber of Commerce. Wanted to make sure I wasn't muted anymore. Um, welcome once again to part two of a webinar about cybersecurity and best practices. We had part one last week, so don't worry if you missed last week. It is on our YouTube channel with the Chamber. It's also on our website. And I'm so glad that we can do this part two. Uh, thank you, Jimmy Keegan, member of the Mount Pleasant Chamber of Commerce with Segra. Thank you so much for being willing to share once again your time and expertise with the Mount Pleasant Chamber of Commerce on a topic that is super important these days during COVID-19 as more of us are working from home and having to rely on the internet to get our jobs done. So thank you so much for being willing to tell us what we need to know about to make sure that our internets are secure. Uh, absolutely. And we appreciate, you know, the invitation to do this. Like you said, it's a, a very important topic. Um, you know, before the, the COVID pandemic struck, uh, we talked about last week, uh, I believe the number was a 600 increase in phishing attempts since the COVID shutdown. So while, while always an important topic, uh, there's an increased, uh, increased importance on it these days. So I'm definitely happy to be a part of it, and we, we appreciate you giving us that opportunity. Thank you. So uh, today, so we'll, actually for those who, who weren't able to join last week um, and may not be familiar with Segra, Segra is kind of an IT telecom hybrid company. Uh, we utilize uh, our fiber network, which is one of, if not the largest, privately held in the, in the nation to deliver internet, voice, data, cloud, and cybersecurity services to our business customers. Um, what we did cover last week, um, and like Rebecca said, it's, it is recorded, it is available for you. Um, what we covered last week was really the different types of attacks that are out there, and then how to educate employees and set policy to protect yourselves against those types of attacks. Today in part two, uh, we're gonna go more into the different technology that exists to help prevent those attacks and uh, the different network designs, the different setups and services um, and technology that can be used to recover uh, in the unfortunate circumstance that you do actually fall victim to one of these attacks. So uh, as to not take up you know, too much more of the time, I'm gonna introduce uh, one of our sales engineers from Segra, Brandon Bailey, uh, who's going to go through the presentation for you today. Um, take it away, Brandon. Hey, everybody. My name is Brandon Bailey. I'm with Segra. I'm, my job at Segra is a sales engineer. Uh, and we are, as Jimmy said before, we are going, this is part two. So we had a nice part one last week. This week we're going to be going over the, the systems and protections for your systems and server based on your business needs. So we're going to go through this uh, from a endpoint protection all the way through backup and servers and what to do in this new world of working from home, working for different locations and how to best protect yourself. So let's get into it. So the first thing that everybody's heard of is antivirus endpoint protection. Uh, when working within the current state, it's very important that all endpoints have antivirus or endpoint protection installed. Uh, antivirus is a product that looks for malicious definitions of viruses, worms, all, all the malicious actors that people use to infiltrate systems and make them do whatever their intent is. So best practices here is to have an antivirus that fits your business needs. Uh, it is installed on all endpoints. It's very important to have a subscription service to antivirus definitions. Uh, because by the, the way that they work is defining a virus characteristics and how they behave in your network or on your servers and systems 
the virus antivirus software looks for that behavior and when it identifies that particular behavior it will quarantine it and block off all the malicious codes that is trying to access your different systems the antivirus companies work very diligently to have their definitions updated they're always out in the field gathering up new viruses and putting together the definitions for those, pushing those out to your uh, subscribed antivirus systems to ensure that you've got the latest updates and are seeing everything out there. Uh, definitions are pushed out on an as needed basis. So as, as new threats are discovered, those definitions are pushed into your antivirus software. Later on, we'll get into the different uh, antivirus softwares and, and who are the leaders in the market and kind of the niche players. But some of the things you want to think about during your decision making process to choose an antivirus are, are what we've got on the screen here. So uh, something that can be installed and deployed on all endpoints, uh, a subscription to the update and definition service. You want a central control mechanism and this makes just ease of management on the back end um, a lot more manageable. So a central control system being that I've got a portal that I can have all my employees in there with all their devices and, and see exactly what is, what's going on with those definitions and making sure that I've got all the relevant information that all of my people are being protected. We want to make sure that there is an automatic update push service so that we're not having to manually select download updates. We want those updates to come down from the virus software provider uh, as they release them. So we've got the quickest response time and I have the most up-to-date definitions all of the time. We also want to have an uh, antivirus that has logging and reporting. Uh, that can be used in its, its own silo, meaning that you can use it out of the antivirus software itself, or it can feed over into a more advanced a logging and reporting system, which we'll talk about later on. So on your uh, on the left side of your screen, you'll see a, a Gartner Magic Quadrant. And here's where we're gonna talk about decision-making pro product, um, deciding what product to go with. So you're going to want to look at this from a business need standpoint. And if you are, in a niche market or you do some very specific things to get the antivirus that is going to work best for you. So that's something that um, you'll kind of want to take a look at how your workforce is and where they're spread out to uh, and, the, and their particular behavior and habits to choose the right one. The, the other biggest piece, and if I can stress this enough, is, is don't go with the free version. It's, it's very tempting to have, oh, there's free versions out there. Um, they work and, and thinking to yourself, oh, they, this is going to work just fine. Uh, those free versions have, have caveats. Uh, as we all know, the old saying goes is nothing is ever really free. Uh, so having a subscription service to guarantee that you're getting the most up to date and that your information is not being shared with the, a, a, an extended community. So you want to have a software that fits your needs, you want to have a pay service for it, so that that is a, an agreement between you and the antivirus company that your information will be kept within your, within your silo. Uh, some other questions you wanna ask for is, what support is offered if I do get infected with a, a virus? Or outside of viruses, if, if something is interacting incorrectly with antivirus software, say a legitimate line of business application is having, um, for lack of better words, a, a battle with your antivirus software and it's stopping it from doing some functions. Um, antivirus software said it can be the gambit of very aggressive to, to very passive. So we wanna make sure that there's support offered so that we can tie and, and tailor those needs and the virus software and create those exemptions for any kind of line of business software so that it's not interfering with your workforce um, and it, you, you're getting all of that benefits of the virus software without any of the drawbacks. Ask yourself again, 
does the software support remote updates? This is very important, especially for our, our spread out workforce as everybody's not inside the office. And, and just a quick background on, on the way viruses used to work, uh, virus software used to work. The controller module would go onto the server, everybody's inside the network, inside the office, all of the computers are connected to that server. That server is talking to each one of those endpoints and saying, okay, have you gotten the latest updates? and pushing those updates out. With today's situation, a lot of the workforce is out and about, so we're not inside the office. So having a service that has a cloud-based system to where that those, it doesn't matter if your people are inside the office, outside the office, as long as they have internet connectivity, the software can push new and updated definitions out to all of the clients. Um, Again, central management is very important. Just being able to look, pop into a single pane of glass and see who has received all the latest up, updates and who has is missing any kind of updates so that your IT team can take action to correct those responsibilities. Uh, and also have a point if you want to tie in a larger reporting and log gathering system into that, which again, we will talk about later so that we can get better overall visibility to the network it's important to have that central management that's accessible from the internet. Uh, over on the left side, we'll talk about Magic Quadrant real, real quick. Gartner puts out a review of antivirus software every year. Um, the players change occasionally, but as far as the, the big players in the market, uh, ESET, Microsoft, Trend Micro, Symantec, are kind of the the top level they're the, the the big guys in the in the game they've been doing it for a very long time and you will see as year over year this will change uh, uh, who is in the leaders in the field and Gartner is basically doing a you know, here's their vision the comparison of the antivirus company's vision based on their ability to execute on that vision and if you look up in the right hand corner uh, Sophos, Trend Micro, Symantec, uh, CrowdStrike, which is kind of a new player to the market, and Microsoft are the leaders this year. So that means that their, their vision and their ability to ex execute on that vision are lining up in the best possible way. The next thing we want to talk about is edge protection. Um, firewall your network. We never want to have our networks exposed to the open internet because you know, there's people out there, malicious actors, who are going to take advantage of that. So we're going to talk about some different types of, of firewalls. And up in the, up in the top right-hand corner is pretty much a basic model um, with, of how a firewall works. You've got computer node on the other side of the internet that you're receiving information from passes through the firewall into the internal network. The job of the firewall is to filter out any malicious traffic. Uh, that means viruses, malicious actors, hackers, uh, brute force attacks, intrusion pre prevention. So basically it's, it's actively looking for behavior on the network that is not conducive to the everyday business application. Uh, down on the left-hand corner, we've got a more advanced firewall setup. This is uh, what's called an HA cluster or a firewall cluster. That means you've got two or more firewalls um, in doing dual duty, and they, they hand off different pieces of the cluster, and this is for, for two things. So if one of the firewalls were to go down, you are able to have a secondary firewall in place so that you're not losing any connectivity. The second piece of it is to balance that uh, the workload between those two firewalls. And in this particular example, you can see how the information is sent to both firewalls uh, and they are acting to handle that traffic internally between the two firewalls. And again, if either one of them goes down, you've got the ability to fail over to the secondary node. So some of the types of firewalls is we've got the traditional firewall, which is handled by a, a NAT or a network address translation. It's the most basic level. Very little filtering, but it's it's changing your your addressing from the public internet into a private network, and then blocking any kind of port that would flow over uh, traffic flowing over different ports. Ports in a firewall are kind of like uh, keyways. So 
each service has its own port to, to carry information over. Uh, internet flows over one port, uh, database layer flows over a different port. So you can open and close those small doors to, to gain a more granular um, protection of your particular network. So if you're not using database servers, you close that hole and no traffic is going to flow across the database gateway. Then we get into uh, next generation fires, firewalls, which build on top of the traditional firewall model by adding in intelligence uh, to that. Those intelligent firewall, again, use definition and some uh, pattern recognition logic to look for different types of behavior that a regular firewall is just going to miss. So this gets into the more advanced hacking, the more advanced um, injection techniques that the malicious actors are using out in the world today to get past some of those traditional firewalls. Uh, where you've got with the next generation firewalls, it does what they call stateful inspection, meaning that it's looking down through the different layers of the data stream coming through the firewall, looking for any kind of patterns to identify this is a malicious actor, this should not be happening. So we've got intrusion prevention, uh, gateway antivirus, and a list of other different services that the traffic is scanned by the firewall and then passed onto the network. That firewall can has the ability to recognize those patterns and say, okay, we can't do this. Uh, those firewalls also have advanced reporting to say, okay, somebody has tried to get into the network using this type of attack and it will list the day, time, and give you all the relevant information for your IT department to put better security protocols in place. Uh, the next type, which was the newer type, is a hosted or cloud-based firewall. Uh, and the biggest difference here is with the first two, you have physical devices that reside on your network edges, uh, meaning that it sits between your network and the internet. <clears throat> With a hosted firewall, there's no physical device. It still sits on the edge of your network between the internet and your network. Um, the, the nice thing about hosted firewalls is updates and scalability are on demand. So you are receiving updates as they come out from the firewall provider services and they are being updated and pushed into your er, firewall, your hosted firewall uh, as, as they happen in, in real time. The, the nice thing there is typically those are hosted with inside data centers. So you've got uh, that speed to throughput and also scalability of the particular firewall uh, to make sure that you're able to handle all the traffic coming across the network. And you're like, why, why would a fireball, firewall need to be scalable? Um, well, firewalls are designed in tiers. So each unit with inside of a product set will have, it can handle up to so many connections per hour or so many connections per second coming into that firewall If and also the amount of throughput. So if I've got a 10 meg connection coming into my office I and with, with you know 10 people behind the firewall, I choose this particular box. If I outgrow that particular box, then I have to purchase a new firewall, a new physical box that needs to be configured and put into my particular network. With the hosted firewalls, if you are in a growth mode and you, you're growing or changing, that firewall can be dynamically changed to meet the needs of the network based on what is currently there without having to cause downtime, without having to purchase a new physical box. It's just, it can just be changed. Some of the other lesser used firewalls uh, that are done in more advanced configurations are we, we can put in a database firewall so that even intranetwork, if your database is, especially when it's dealing with secure data or proprietary data or you know, uh, IP um, technologies that you are wanting to silo off your database, database firewalls can be put in place to, to manage that connections to the database, making sure that only the traffic that is supposed to be connecting to that particular database gets in. Uh, another, another lesser used technology is a web application firewall. The, the scenario that this is used in is if you've got an e-commerce website where you've got a lot of, where you have to expose it to the internet for people to use the systems, 
uh, this firewall looks for very specific behavior that is not within that defined set of instructions. So, you know, it's not somebody coming in trying to purchase something on the website. It's somebody trying to knock on a back door and, and gain access from there. But it is exposed to the internet and handles all of that traffic that is going over that website connection. So again, what to look for when you're choosing a firewall is I recommend a next generation or state for firewall. That is again, deep packet inspection. So everything across the network is being run through that firewall to handle the uh, different types of track, uh, traffic that are coming across the network and doing a deep dive into that traffic to ensure that nothing is being snuck or smuggled across your, your lines. Uh, a, a firewall that is can provide regular updates. Uh, something to, just a side note here, for firewalls that need regular updates, they do require a subscription based so that you, if you purchase a physical box, you also have to purchase a subscription service to go along with that to continue to get those updates from the companies. Hosted firewalls include that on top of the management fees. It also eliminates any need for external management. So the company that's providing the hosted firewall will handle the, the management of the firewall, putting all those updates, making sure that, um, as we all know, maybe somebody didn't renew the latest subscription and you're exposed to an older version of definitions. So you also wanna look for on-demand support, something that you can call in and say, okay, I'm having a problem either with a legitimate application that's not working through my firewall or something that needs to be addressed as far as a security concern. Hey, there is an attempted attack at this particular point. What can I do? So just having that on-demand support there is very important for especially small business owners who don't always have the time to, to sit there and manage a firewall. Uh, right sizing your firewalls. Like, again, they come in different sizes based on capacity and throughput. So making sure that we're achieving that right size and we can eliminate that by going with a hosted firewall. Uh, it doesn't always make sense in all cases to go with a hosted firewall. So just making sure that you've right sized that and firewall life cycles typically have a three to five year life cycle. So kind of planning five years out for the most, um, the most, the longest duration of that firewall could be in place and kind of planning on how that, will look, how your company will look in five years. Um, management, they come in different flavors. So we can have self-management, which is again, you as uh, the business owner or your IT department will be fully responsible for that particular firewall. Uh, Co-manage is where you're, you're doing a hosted firewall or even an on-prem firewall and you're sharing it with an ISP, something um, or um, a managed service company. Maybe your outsourced IT department, something that both your internal people and the, the outsource IT department can co-manage. And then fully manage is basically, you don't wanna deal with it, call somebody else, let them handle it, and they take care of it, make your vision and wishes come true within that firewall. It's also very important, especially for later on, for talking about this overall visibility is to have uh, systems integration. And that comes into play when you've got VPN or remote sites that are, that, so let's say you've got a work workforce uh, that a Salesforce and they're working out of their homes. Uh, they're connecting via VPN client, maybe on their laptop, maybe on their computer that will be able to log into that firewall and extend the network from the firewall into their computer. So it's acting like it is on network. Uh, that is important to have that integration with your domain services so that you can, for ease of user management. Uh, managing users in two different places um, will cause a headache for everybody. So that means that your IT department has to manage two sets of credentials and your end users have to manage and remember two different sets of logins. So having that integrated to where it's a single sign-on is a, is a big piece to ease of management. The next piece in this overall strategy is, is content filtering. Um, so what is content filtering? Uh, content filtering is filtering traffic coming from the internet to your end users. Uh, that comes into play of if you do not 
people at the office don't need to look at certain sites. It might be um, uh, violence or guns or um, sexual content. These are all things you do not want into the business network. Those are also uh, places that you can say, okay, here's a particular vulnerability of security, uh, or they don't need to use this, uh, don't need to access those because it presents a greater risk. On the flip side, it also um, prevents people, you can put in content filtering for social media. So that if you don't particularly want your employees looking at YouTube or Facebooking on, on, the, on the company's clock or across the company's internet connection, and we can put those uh, in place to say, okay, if I go to facebook.com, it just pops up and says, this has been filtered out. Uh, this site is not accessible within the network. Uh, and that helps with a couple of things. It, you can, it can be a productivity killer. It can be a, a bandwidth hog. So kind of overarching solution and also keeping people away from those malicious sites that could potentially inject um, malicious software, adware, malware, viruses, ransomware into your network. So this it stops it at the firewall level and, and keeps that continuity. So again, why do you need it, it for those reasons of preserving bandwidth, um, keeping up productivity. If, if that's not part of people's jobs, then you, and you don't want them looking into it, you can put that all up so you can control what your employees or endpoints are accessing within the network. So how do you implement that? Uh, it's it, content filtering services. You would sign up for a content filtering service. You would uh, import all of your users out of your Active Directory. And then you would um, choose what to filter. So content filtering providers have a ginormous list. Uh, and it gets everything from straight categories to like from you can select e-commerce, you can select social media. Uh, or you can drill down into the very specific types of sites that you do not want them to access. It will also have exemptions to say, if I don't want people looking at a, uh, a certain overarching category, but maybe within that category they need to access something, then we can allow those exemptions to flow through. So integration with Active Directory, again, is, is a, you're integrating that with your domain services so all of your users everything is going to be within that active directory that is who has access to the network that is your login to your computers but also integrating that in with your content filtering so that you can manage groups and this is all looking down to ease of management so in a particular company you might not have or want everybody filtered on the same particular overarching strategy. Maybe you've got a finance department that needs access to banking sites. And so you can create a group that is accounting and finance and they've got access to these specific sites. Maybe you've got a permitting department that needs access to specific government sites. So you create a different policy for them and give, attach a different content filtering policy to that. Maybe you've got a social media manager who needs access to Twitter and Facebook and any of the other social media networks, and they need to be able to post company content onto those sites. So again, you can create those groups within your company's Active Directory and link those to the content filtering sites. And then it's just as easy as moving the person's name into the, each one of those groups to give access to more uh, or open or close the content filtering as needed. So system updates. Everybody I'm sure has seen a pop-up for have you updated now from either Windows or your phone or any of the other devices that we've got now. It is extremely important that we apply those updates in a in the fastest amount of time possible. Uh, these companies are are not pushing this out out of the um, just because they want to be good guys and give you new features all the time, although that is part of it. It is these companies are finding vulnerabilities within their software as they're working with the cybersecurity community to identify those new vulnerabilities. And as they come out, they are patched and they push those out within updates. So the scenario here is if you've got a machine that is out of date by six months, 
you've got six months of vulnerability that could potentially expose you to more a greater footprint of, of hacking attacks because not just like in life everything all the all the hackers or malicious actors are not created equally but as those vulnerabilities circle around the different places that the hacker community or the malicious actor community gets their information from it becomes more available and you are exposing yourself to more and more vulnerabilities which are older uh, and that haven't been patched so that you've got more people coming after you. The, you want to confirm within your network and within all of the systems that all of those updates are being installed on a timely manner and that all of your systems are at the same level. So being able to see exactly how those updates are applied into what systems they're applied is extremely important, especially in today's world of working remotely and getting everybody who is outside of the network or working from home, keeping them updated in a timely manner. So having that feedback into a system where you can do some overarching reporting and, and discovery on what systems and making sure that you can remediate those, those problems is, is very important. Uh, so updates can be applied to a myriad of different equipment. Um, all, pretty much all IT systems get updated at some point. Uh, that means applications within inside your stack will, will take updates. Uh, the best example I can use here is Microsoft Office. Everybody has, I'm sure, worked with Office. But those, those applications also have vulnerabilities. And that can be anything from Microsoft Dynamics, um, Oracle, any of those software systems, application systems will require updates to be patched. Network equipment, again, firewalls require updates, even switches. Um, as, as that traffic flows across those, those devices have vulnerabilities discovered, the same thing, they will release a patch to fix those holes or vulnerabilities in those devices. Operating systems, this is probably the most standard. We've all seen the pop-up for Microsoft update saying you need to update your machine. Again, it is something that they are pushing out to stop a problem from occurring within your system. They're patching holes, patching vulnerabilities, and then your devices down to iPads, um, Android, and the different systems that we use on our mobile, our mobile devices. Um, patching those operating systems as well. Especially as iPads or personal devices become more prevalently used or more um, used more heavily in the business world. So wireless networks, we all love Wi-Fi. Uh, Wi-Fi is a, an essential part of business today. It gives us the ability to walk around an office and remain connected. Uh, it gives us the ability to do what we need to without running extra cables, uh, but it, it can also be a really big vulnerability. The wireless network the biggest pieces of the wireless network are your encryption key and allowing guest access so especially for the smaller size businesses if i've got a i walk into a you know a, a, a car repair shop or a coffee shop and i can get on to their wi-fi and work from there that's ultra convenient for me and to be able to do what i need to do in their particular location it can also be a hazard. So if, if we're opening up our network and business systems to our guests or clients, uh, things can happen either inadvertently or maliciously. Uh, that is exposing your system to those, your internal business systems to somebody who is not a part of your organization. So, when you're setting up a wireless network, if you're going to, the first thing you want to do is enable a complex encryption key. It's just like we talked about in the previous session about complex passwords. It's very important to have a complex key. Uh, it's even better to do a rotational on, a, on some kind of time frame to change that key. Uh, and, and especially if employees leave to make those changes so that um, we're not exposing our business to 
somebody who has worked there previously or somebody who has uh, received a passcode to get into your network. The, the next most important piece there is to segregate guest and corporate traffic. And what that means is when you're creating wireless, most wireless systems have the ability to create what's called a guest network. That guest network does not allow traffic to pass into the corporate network. It is essentially routing it to the internet only. So you're, you're providing that free service. You're giving your, your clients that extra, oh, this is great. I can sit here and wait for whatever I'm doing and I can still work and do it, but you're not endangering your information systems with allowing them to go through your corporate network to get to the internet. So rule of thumb is to lock down guest, ac guest access to internet only, meaning it doesn't touch any of your information systems. It doesn't touch your corporate network. It just goes straight to the internet. But again, you're providing that convenience for your, your clients. Um, I, I always say apply content filtering to those, um, those guest Wi-Fi networks. Again, just something that you wouldn't want your employees looking at, you wouldn't want coming into your network. Um, and even thinking about it from this, if I am sitting in a, in a waiting room or I'm sitting uh, waiting for to, to speak to whoever and I start um, or I start surfing content that is offensive to maybe somebody else in the network or uh, somebody, <laughs> somebody else in the waiting room, that we want to limit that as much as possible. Not everybody's going to go in there and just start streaming whatever they want to do, but it does prevent the, the awkward situation of we don't want to be offensive to our other customers. And to uh, limit data speeds, remembering that that guest Wi-Fi access is going to be consuming uh, a part of our total internet pipe. So if we've got a uh, 10 meg circuit and I've got a couple of people streaming Netflix, which nothing wrong with that um, Sitting there waiting doing whatever Streaming Netflix across there that will take away that whatever that bandwidth is being consumed by those devices streaming network away from your business systems So putting a limitation on that and saying okay, I'm going to dedicate out of my 10 megs of, of internet I'll dedicate one meg of internet access to my guests and, and they can share that particular pipe so that we're having less impact to our business systems. If, so setting up a wireless, uh, going back real quick, uh, setting up the wireless systems is a, a definitely a customized solution, uh, especially putting out wireless access points to get all the, the coverage that you need. If, if that is something that you would like to discuss further in detail with uh, Jimmy and I, we are available for those questions. Please reach out. We're glad to talk about your particular environment. So monitoring your system. This is getting into exactly what's going on in your network. And the way I like to look at it is you don't know what you don't know. So if you are, if there is a piece of software that's malicious and sitting there passively collecting information and sending that off to somebody who is doing a information um, mining off of your company, being able to recognize those patterns is very important. So knowing what's going on in your network and having that visibility in there is, is a key piece to, to cybersecurity. So cybersecurity professionals and malicious actors are they're constantly in a battle or competing to stay ahead of each other. Uh, the, the hacker community or the um, malicious actors come out with new ways. They find new vulnerabilities to get into the network. There are pattern recognition systems um, that can identify those particular patterns uh, that are gathering information. And we'll talk more about that in a second. But even the best protected network, um, even you've put in all of these controls, content filtering, wireless segregation, uh, edge protection, everything we've done up till this point, it's still, you still can get compromised because again, that community is out there looking for new ways to access your information um, in, to get what they're looking for. So having a system that can do predictive modeling with some logic to look for pattern recognition, meaning that we're not, we're not relying on definitions at this point. We are, we're looking for patterns within the network. So 
one of the systems that we use to accomplish this is a, is a SOC and a SIM. Um, they are systems, the SIM is an application that is aware, it, it gets definitions uh, from security companies to look for exactly what's happening in new, new networks. Um, those security companies are constantly, basically exposing networks uh, to, to these uh, attacking and making them look very appetizing to, to get into. And what they're doing is, is they want those people to come in there and they want them to perform the new or the latest and greatest um, hacks or ways of entry and so that they can see that. The, the other side of the system is it gets, it gathers a baseline for what is happening at different times, the different patterns. So this is looking for the pattern that is standard within your corporate network, identifying that. And then once you've established that baseline, it will start looking for patterns outside of the normal day-to-day -day workflow. And as soon as those are identified, it can do an alert saying, okay, Typically, Bob, our CEO, doesn't try to log on the network 100 times at midnight. That's probably a problem. I'm going to go ahead and send an alert and saying somebody's trying to get into our network. Or with a somebody has logged on to a system that is normally only accessed uh, during daylight hours. Again, it's, it's pattern recognition based on times of day, uh, based on the normal business process. If you want help with um, talking about further about SOC and SIM and how that they can help your network, uh, please reach out to Jimmy or I. It's again, it's a very customized solution based on your particular business needs uh, and scaling that. The last thing we've got is, uh, is backup. You know, we want, when everything else goes wrong, we want to have a backup. No matter how many systems and, and good things we put in place up front, having that backup is the confidence to know that no matter what happens, I can recover and I can keep going. So uh, if a malicious actor does gain um, access to your system, restoring from a clean backup could be your best course of action. And this comes into play with uh, the new ransomwares that are out there is maybe we don't we don't really want to pay them a ransom, so we're just going to go back into a point of time where before that system was infected and get all of our data back. So obviously ransomware has become the new hot topic. We've seen it all over the news. It, it infects a system and it encrypts all the data within your business system so it's not accessible for you or any of your employees. Uh, a message usually pops up on one of your computers saying that we've got your data, pay this, exorbitant amount of money to us and we'll probably unlock your data and give it back to you. Uh, do you want to risk paying somebody you don't know and have never heard of and the first time you've met them they've stolen some of your stuff? Uh, pay them a bunch of money and then rely on them to release that data? It's, it's a very hard thing. That's kind of a if, if for last resorts, if you don't have a good backup in place, then you're probably looking down that particular path. But having that backup in place is key to preventing, to having to get to that particular point. So good backups means peace of mind. Uh, no matter what happens, you can recover from it. So we'll get into some of the different types of backups. And I know we're running low on time here, so I'm going to just run through this real quick. So there's different types of backups. Um, Traditionally, the, the oldest style of backup is a file level backup, meaning that you're taking uh, just backups of individual files, you're storing those uh, either locally or somewhere else. And you can just restore back to those files, uh, restore those files back to your production system. That does not include um, operating system or system state. Then we've got the traditional uh, backup system. So there's the traditional way of doing things is full incremental differential. The, the, the differences there is if we're taking full backups, um, every single backup you take is going to be about the same size, maybe a little bit less than your full system size. So every version you've got of that is going to be a lot of space. Uh, then you've got a little bit better way of doing things. It's a space saver and it helps backups um, occur more rapidly is incremental. And that's basically where you take a full backup 
and that on on the left side down at the bottom you'll see a little infographic uh, talking about the incremental backups or the traditional way of the traditional incremental backup basically you've got a a full backup that occurs and then a bunch of incremental backup that have all the change data that has occurred between the time that the full ba full backup was taken and the the last incremental backup was was taken in this particular scenario, restoring from an incremental backup means that you have to take the base image and then all of these other issue, uh, backups that are occurring daily here, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, uh, through Sunday, and you're pushing them back into the full backup. So speed to recovery is, is not your friend in this particular situation. You've got to compress all those files back into your full backup and then use that compressed file with all the information leading up to the most recent file restored into there and then restored into your production environment. The, the new way, the Segger way we do things is we reverse that. So we flipped it on its head and do it a, did a reverse incremental backup, meaning that the full backup is always your most current state. And the, the software will take, that, uh, take those incremental backups and inject them into the full backup so that that full backup is always on and ready to be turned up. And that what that does is give you speed to recovery. So if something goes down, that file is already prepared with all of the latest information up to the, the last backup point uh, to be ready to be restored in your environment. Uh, and then differential backups is something that's not used so much anymore, but Again, it's it's uh, incremental, but it each file instead of being a small incremental backup, the differential backs up the difference between the full backup and and the latest copy with all of the data between your full backup and the most recent copy. What that does is gives you exponential uh, backup size growth, and that that can be an impact to storage as well. So. One of, the, one of the biggest advantages or step forward we've done in, in the backup world is image-based backups, which essentially is a snapshot or a picture of a state and time of your, of your systems. And so it's, it's capturing it at the, or the operating system level all the way down to the application level uh, and even granular below there. So application aware means that the backup software understands that there are different types of software running in this particular environment and it does the backups thoughtfully so that that information can be restored to an individual application or restored to a, a global um, recovery point so meaning i can restore, restore the application data itself but i can also restore the entire system uh, same thing with database aware it just means it's going to get more granular if you've got databases running and you need to restore some information uh, the database aware backups will say, okay, I store this data in a thoughtful manner so that if I just need to restore a single database, I can do that. Or if I need to restore all of them or even a system restore, I can, I can pick each one of those and just gives me a, a greater flexibility for my recover, recovery environment. Uh, again, email granular recovery just means that instead of if your email system goes down, um, you can recover the entire system, or if there's an accidental deletion uh, or a, an intentional deletion of a particular mailbox, maybe it was um, a disgruntled employee, maybe it was an accident, somebody pressed a button a couple times and, and you've deleted their full mailbox. Instead of having to restore the full system, we can get down to just restoring that particular email person's email, or even uh, lower than that of just for being able to restore a few emails from backup. So planning for backup and business continuity. Oops, that was my fault. It's, it's, it's a big undertaking to look at your total systems and what you're going to do with the backup and continuity planning, meaning I've got all my systems backed up, but then what do I do when I have to fail over to a backup? And once I'm running in a, in a backup environment, what do I do to get back to my production environment? 
and what what do my employees need to do? Is there any changes in that in the way that we access that data? Those have to be thought through in a total continuity solution to be able to say, okay, my systems have just gone down. We've recovered to the recovery environment. That recovery environment's inside of a data center. Now, how do I get my employees connected to that data so that they can continue working? So having all that planned out up front and knowing exactly what steps you need to do and putting together essentially a run book to say, okay, in this situation, once we failed over here, make these changes and we can get back up and going. So that is something, you know, please reach out if you've got any more questions to Jimmy or I. We're glad to run through the different scenarios with business continuity and planning. Uh, and, and these are just um, some things that we take into consideration when we're doing this backup and, and business continuity planning is uh, external threats, accidental deletions, physical damage, natural disasters are just uh, some of the aspects to think about when, when planning for that business continuity and making sure that you're, you're staying up as, as much as possible and losing time, as little time as possible. Uh, something else to always do is, is store those, um, store backups that are encrypted offsite in a secure data center. Um, the, the days of having a, a USB drive plugged into your server um, is just a way to have a particular problem, especially when you're dealing with physical damage. Um, some of the things that I can talk about where I've actually seen are uh, sprinkler systems going off on your, on your servers. Um, it's not too far off to have some kind of accident that uh, with, with power systems that can cause that. And so if all of your backups are on site, those could be, interrupt your work speed to recovery. So having that stored in an encrypted uh, fit state in a data center that you can access and be able to spin up a recovery environment is essential for speed to recovery and getting your team back up and working. So again, we talked about having a recovery plan. What do we need to do? What are all the steps that we need to do if a if an accident occurs? And that is that's a layered approach again, because if if we've got a corruption in the operating system or we've been taken over by ransomware, we might do this particular situation. If the hardware that the servers and business systems are running in has has a problem, some piece of hardware fails, what do we do to recover those systems? How do we get into those systems once they're in a recovery environment? So it's a, it's a lot of pieces and parts that we've got to go through to, to tailor those needs for your, your particular business needs. Um, understanding your business RTO and RPO, love some acronyms. Um, recovery R, RTO is recovery time objective, and that's how fast your, your company um, needs to get back up and running. Like how long can I be down for before it is detrimental to my business health. And that is a, it's a question that you've got to look very closely at. Um, and, and I'll just say this, uh, a lot of companies that working with will say, oh, I can be without my data for you know, a couple of days. Being coming from the managed service provider side of the house, when I hear someone say, oh, I can be without my data for a couple of days, that always makes me think that you know, we haven't thought through the whole process because inevitably when a disaster hits, I need access to this, this now because I've got this other thing coming up. And, and thinking through all of those, the, the critical path and understanding what needs to happen and, and maybe not the majority of the time, but even thinking about like, oh, maybe we've got a particular presentation that we've got to prepare for. And just thinking through all those um, situations and understanding really what you need, how fast you need to recover your data in a worst case scenario. And then recovery point objective is your tolerance for data loss in between backup points. So that means that like, maybe I'm taking backups every hour, maybe I'm taking backups once a day, depending on these different systems. Maybe I need to have those systems up to date. So a couple of examples there is, I've got a web server that doesn't really change very much, so I might back that one up once a week. Uh, I've got a database server that information is is changing on a minute by minute time frame, and I need to have a a streaming data backup. So I have zero tolerance for any data loss. Uh, think about insurance or credit card processing. You've got zero tolerance um, for for data loss. So thinking through those and putting together a thoughtful plan 
uh, and tailoring that for your individual business systems is, is key. Uh, the, other, the other key is to test those backups and the recovery platform because your, your backups are great. You know, like, oh, okay, I've got my systems backing up. I'm, I'm doing good. Well, can we recover from that? Can the recovery platform that we've selected handle the, the full process of those production systems? So testing that and making sure that it's tailored correctly to your business needs is extremely important. Um, having those backups tested and saying, okay, now I know that these systems will be able to recover and run in the recovery environment. And I don't have to worry about that when it comes down to a disaster. So that is all, again, that's a lot of information thrown at you. Um, Jimmy or I would love to take time if you've got questions offline and discuss any of these um, cybersecurity keys and, and the overarching uh, continuity planning to, to protect your businesses um, anytime. Thank you so much, Brandon. This was very informative. Again, it's Rebecca with the Mount Pleasant Chamber of Commerce. Jimmy, I see your uh, contact information on that screen right there. I encourage people to reach out to you. Um, I have a quick question though. Has um, SACRA changed any of its cybersecurity processes as a result of COVID-19? In uh, 10 words or less. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have. Uh, we've got some actual videos on our, our website talking about specifically the COVID-19 um, pandemic and the, the new kind of world that we're looking at. Uh, Segra is a very, very thoughtful company and, and from my perspective has done a lot with their employees and their systems to adjust to the new quote unquote normal out there. Very good. Jimmy, do you have anything to add? This was another wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you. And yeah, I just, I just think it's important to, to kind of know, I mean, you heard Brandon talk about the, that layered approach. Um, you know, again, so many people we talk to say, so what are you doing for security? And say, well, I have a firewall. Um, right. And that's, that's good. That's, the, that's one of the layers that you need. But, you know, through what we talked about last week and this week, you can see that you know, the education of the people within your company, um, the setting of, of different policies, the enforcement of those policies, um, you know, all the way through to, you know, active, active monitoring of your devices, um, you know, and then a proper backup or disaster recovery plan are all the pieces that you need to, to truly, uh, you know, be doing everything you can to secure your IT environment, um, you know, and, and we definitely recommend a proactive approach to it. Um, you know, prevention is obviously, you know, first and foremost, but that recovery needs to be there, uh, being proactive by monitoring your logs and, and all of that um, really helps cut down on the time before a breach is discovered. Uh, there's a statistic out there that says the average cyber breach goes on for 197 days before it's discovered. Uh, so by doing a proactive approach and doing active monitoring, you know, there are ways where you can get that 197 days shortened down to about three minutes. Um, so you know, if, you, if you're not being proactive, you are potentially opening yourself up to only realizing that there's a problem uh, when, it's, when it's been there for you know, six months or, or more. So you know, definitely be proactive, definitely reach out to us with any, any additional questions, concerns, anything you may have uh, or want to discuss. So, um, you know, Rebecca, we, we really appreciate, again, the, the invitation to do this. Uh, we hope people get a lot out of it. And, um, you know, we, we just we appreciate the, the chamber and, you know, you, you inviting us to talk to people this way. Well, thank you. We appreciate, once again, your time and expertise today. You see Jimmy's 
contact information there with Sagra, jimmy.keegan at sagra.com. And uh, thank you for those who attended today in person live event. And thank you to those who are watching this on the recording. This is recorded. It's available on our YouTube channel with the Mount Pleasant Chamber, as well as our website. Uh, this one will be up in probably about 30 minutes. So uh, thanks everyone. We appreciate uh, everyone's time today and make it a great rest of the day.